My name is Amy Dilday, and I'm from McCumber Daniels. I represent Bartow Regional Medical Center. Judge Silverman, if I may have five minutes for rebuttal, please. Very good. Amendment 7 gives patients the right to access any medical records produced or received in the course of a hospital's business that relate to adverse medical incidents. The documents listed at numbers 15, 16, and 20 on Privilege Log B are external reports procured by Bartow's external uh, counsel. And because these external documents were not made in the course of the hospital's business, they are protected by opinion, work product, and attorney-client privilege. The court erred in ordering the hospital to produce them. Both, both briefs have cited quite a few cases on different aspects of this legal issue, but I don't recall one directly dealing with the issue of an outside expert report. Is there none that has construed this under the constitutional provision? None, Your Honor. The majority of cases that Florida appellate courts and the Supreme Court have dealt with deal with the actual incident reports that are done under the risk management statutes required by uh, health care facilities. Um, there's a case that deals with peer review. That's the Emmy sub case, and it deals with peer review documents that involved um, a, a hospital's review of a dispute between doctors as if one doctor possibly stealing another doctor's patients, those kind of things. There are absolutely no cases that have dealt with when a hospital goes to an attorney and says, we have a problem or a potential problem here, we'd like you to look into it, and the attorney then turns to an outside source and says, could you give us an opinion on this that comes back to the attorney and, and the hospital as well, well? Help me with one part of this because neither of you, there's a lot of parsing that goes on in these cases as far as the uh, language. And this is a question that maybe your opposing counsel will, uh, I'll have to ask as well. But section 25, article 10, section 25, item three, adverse medical incident. And towards the end of it, it says, incidents that are reported to or reviewed by any healthcare facility, peer review, risk management, quality assurance, and so forth, or any representative of such committees. And your position is, although I don't think you argued it quite this way, this is not a health care <coughs> facility peer review or similar health care facility committee. Correct. And, and I probably didn't argue it exactly that way, but, well, well obviously the hospital is, is a facility. What my argument is that these documents were not created, were not produced, were not in the context of the peer review, the risk management, all of those self-policing These are external statutory. to any health care facility committee. Correct, Your Honor. Now, Correct. the lawyer that requested this peer review analysis does refer to it as peer review. Yes, he does. And, and the documents might even say peer review on it, but absolutely they have referred to them as peer review all along. But, but Your Honors, I mean, hospital counsel, defense counsel in general rely on outside experts all the time to determine the validity of a claim or a potential claim against a hospital, to uh, determine a value of the claim and, and to identify all kinds of things. Whether we call these expert opinions peer reviews or other things, the point is that the statutes do put in place a required peer review for the hospital. That's section um, but three. I'm not sure what opposing counsel has seen because these documents have still been maintained confidentially as best I can tell from the record. Uh, but somewhere it's been disclosed to them that yes. this is a confidential peer reviewed document. Yes, sir. And when it is referred to in that manner, doesn't that sort of scream out, this is an Article, 20, uh, a Article 25 document? It does, it does. They, they, they were, uh, had been called that all along, I think, during the trial counsel and even in my briefs, I used that same language that they did in, and it does scream out that. But the, the difference is that in the peer review process, process the hospital's required to have a written, a binding procedure in place to conduct that process. The hospitals required it to have licensure under it, and unlike the risk management process that requires the, the creation of these incident reports, the peer review process, the statute, does not require the creation of any particular report. In the record, under Privilege Log A, the hospital listed 
all kinds of reports, committee reports, um, different documents that came from their internal peer review um, processes. And the court looked at those reports, required productions of the ones that it deemed uh, were responsive to Amendment 7 production, and the hospital complied with that production. The, the hospital put these other reports separately. They were called peer review reports, but, reports, but the deal is that the hospital the went to the outside counsel. The facilities peer review reports have been provided? All the, yes. All those that were listed in uh, privilege log A, um, which were not included in the confidential materials because the hospital's not right. disagreeing with the trial court's decision that those particular documents should have been produced. They produced all those. They produced up front all of the incident reports. In fact, in the hearing, trial counsel um, for the plaintiff said over and over, well, we have all these, this plethora of incident reports, and they said the multiple incident reports that they already had in place. And yes, you can look at privilege log A in the record, and it shows several peer review meetings, the meetings, the notes, documents that were attached to the notes, and all of those things. The court also did the in-camera in inspection. Those are an issue in this case. The things that are at issue are when the court, when the um, hospital went specifically to its external counsel and said, uh, would you do, an, would you look at these potential problems that we might have? That was done in 2010, 2011, even before uh, the hospital had this particular claim against it. And then the counsel went to an outside source and said, look at these records. The council sent specific records, chose certain, they didn't send entire medical records, there were certain dates from certain records that the council sent to the, the committee, which brings in the opinion work product, product privilege because the council reviewed, maybe with the hospital's assistant, but reviewed um, these records, chose certain documents, sent them out to the expert. The statutes require council to use experts. For instance, in the pre-suit process, um, to get reviews, to determine validities of claims. This is a, just a normal part of defense. If you want to say, well, they, they admittedly were, um, they potentially were adverse medical incidents about these reports, it's, it's hard to see some documents that a hospital might be concerned about, might go well, to counsel, assume, might seek. For the sake of argument, if a lawyer hires an outside expert to review a bunch of records relating to the care and treatment of the patient and potentially other information that the lawyer has gathered from the hospital that could shed a light on other problems that a doctor had with other patients. Yes. Is there anything in Article 25 that would, if it weren't called a peer review report, that would take away the traditional analysis that this is my expert, even though my expert's done some legwork for me, that is not discoverable unless I choose to tender that expert for use at trial. Right. There's nothing in Article 10, Section 25 that specifically does I keep saying Article that. 25. Sec section. I, <laughs> I'm trying to make sure I get it right, but I may not. Um, and in fact, the courts, and this was quoted all over the briefs, it's quoted all over the cases. The Supreme Court, in pre-review of the statute, you know, in pre-approval before the, it was sent before the voters, opined that, at least in the context of um, conflicting with um, various branches of government or whatever, this, this constitutional amendment would probably not um, infringe on the, the uh, the rules of procedure that allow I guess, I guess I want to approach it slightly differently. Is there anything out there that says a lawyer's retention of an expert for potential use at trial is automatically discoverable? I mean, traditionally, the answer is no. It's not no. unless you're going to tender that person and use them at trial. No, there is not. And, the, you know, I mean, the best I can get to, to that <coughs> might be the intent that this court said in Chavez was that Amendment 7 was created to eliminate the uh, privilege of the self-policing policies of hospitals. And that, I think, um, in those, we're talking about those specific licensing statutes under 395 that put specific procedures in place that hospitals have to, to follow. And, and again, the one report that's absolutely required on those statutes is the incident reports, and all the cases have dealt with incident reports. Are they discoverable? I think it's pretty well established. The hospital the um, eye clinics, whatever is at issue, has to turn over those incident reports. But 
time and time again, this court and, and other courts have said, there is nothing in Amendment 7 that is going, that, that we see that would breach that opinion work product privilege. They've said in Neely, Judge Altenburn, and, and the court decided that um, the incident reports were discoverable in that case, but in the footnote, Judge Altenburn said there was no evidence that these, these incident reports were created at the request of counsel. Um, I don't that, think any of the cases actually uh, hold those, uh, hold that. It seems to be repeatedly dicta that we think this is what the law is, we think this is what's meant. Right. And Much no, like the attorney-client analysis, nobody comes out and says attorney-client privilege is still intact or is viscer is viscerated. Well, I don't think any court wants to viscerate those privileges, really, because of the, again, the policies that are cited in the cases over and over again. Are you, you, know, are you, are you let me, let me make sure I've got this straight. There, there are three different avenues in play here, it seems to me. Number one, you're arguing that these documents that you're seeking protection for were not made or received in the course of business. That's, that's one argument, That's right? one argument, yes. You're also claiming that they are opinion work product. Yes. Are you also claiming that they're protected by attorney-client privilege? Yes, because the attorney. So, so yes. are you, you're taking a, an either-or approach to this. I'm or giving you any opportunity and... whatsoever to help us protect these documents. Yes, absolutely. But if we agree with the first argument, do do we, do we have reach, to reach the others, other? or are we again adding to the dic the body of <coughs> dicta that's out there? I think so. I think if you reach the outside course of the the, biz, the hospital's business, you don't have to reach the attorney-client privilege because they're not Amendment Seven documents. As far as opinion work product, your argument doesn't dovetail very well with opinion work product. Opinion work product is typically the mental impressions of the lawyer, the yes. opinion of the lawyer. Yes. And as I understand these documents, they're reflective of an expert's opinion. Yes. So how would they? Con how would these documents constitute what we traditionally think of as opinion work product by an attorney? Yes, you find that answer in the Ford Motor case that was cited in our in our reply brief. Um, it, it said that when an attorney would, for instance, go through hospital medical records, which happened in this case, um, if you, I don't know where it is, it probably is in the letter of Supplemental Appendix A at the very back, which, by the way, was never ordered produced, but I included that in the Supplemental Appendix, that August 12th letter by counsel to the review um, experts that he chose. If a lawyer calls out documents and information and provides it to an expert, that might reflect the mental impression of the lawyer. Exactly. We don't have that here though, do we? Yes, we do, in that letter. I thought those, or were those letters, I thought those letters were not subject to production. They, oh, correct, they're not. They're not. It's the expert analysis that of is the specific to Yes, of the, but they're of the specific Do records. Do any of the expert analyses describe the documents that the lawyer asked the expert to review? I think they describe the contents probably only by, by the number of the actual documents. So can you legitimately argue that reviewing that expert or an expert report in this case would somehow disclose the lawyer's strategy for the case? I think at least in the records that the plaintiff has received, yes, because they, the medical record number is on those records and the date, the date of the document that the expert looked at would be in the dates of, of the medical records that the plaintiffs have also received. So yes, I can argue that. I think that that does disclose documents that counsel chose out of a full medical record of thousands of pages or whatever, and said this is the thing that we have the concern is this is what we want you to look at. You have about a minute before you get to well, your uh, um, level time. Then I'm just going to close at this point by saying because the documents were not created within the course of the hospital's business, they were created outside the hospital's business in litigation. Just like um, hospitals might receive notices of intent to sue that have to do with adverse incident reports, but you wouldn't consider that something that they should be turning over to plaintiff's counsel all the time. They're litigation documents. Because they're protected under the opinion work product and attorney-client privilege, this court should quash the order following the in-camera inspection that requires the production of the privilege log documents number 16, 15, and 20. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, may it please the court. Kara Rockenbach on behalf of Amber Edwards. The question that this court must decide 
is does the constitutional amendment, the patient's right to know, approved by the voters in 2004, upheld by the Florida Supreme Court, allow a doctor or a medical provider to circumvent the Constitution by using a lawyer to outsource what is traditionally an in-house uh, peer review to evidence, a third party. Wait, wait, is there any evidence of that in this case? That the lawyer, that the hospital avoided the internal peer review process to outsource it? The only evidence of it, Your Honor, would be the letter um, that was that it provided in, in the supplement, the peer review. And it, Your Honor, is there any dispute that there was internal peer review processes and that information was disclosed? Uh, there are there were many documents objected to in the court disclosed um, internal were, internal reviews. internal peer review yes correct. so how is this a circumvention of what is the traditional internal peer review because it is using a lawyer to do what traditionally would be in house to outsource how is this that? any different than a lawyer hiring an expert uh, I, I understand it's called <laughs> peer review right and that has its own set of implications. But Correct. if the documents suggest that what this lawyer did is hire outside experts to review and advise for purposes of litigation, and there is no defeating or circumventing of the internal peer review, how, I, I, I'm, not, I'm having yeah. trouble following your argument. Okay. Well, it, it actually is circumventing for these particular patients, these particular well, medical no records. Internal peer review that, that was ordered to be discovered, I think you'd have a good argument. But in this case, that's not the case. There's a mix. It's a hybrid. There's definitely some documents that were generated in-house, and then these are the documents that are objected to. These are the, the documents that the trial judge looked at, deemed to be adverse medical incidents, um, determined that Amendment 7, uh, Article uh, 10, Section 25, uh, is applicable and the patient's right to know over, overrides the industry's protection. It's really a matter of consumer protection versus industry self-protection because this is a self-policing um, industry prior to Amendment 7. The shift was a, really a tectonic shift as the Florida Supreme Court recognized. It heralded in a new era in public policy to change in this state to lift the shroud of privilege and confidentiality in order to foster disclosure of information. What's interesting is, and I think Judge Silverman, you noted it, um, the opinion work product, it is not at issue here. It's not in play because traditional opinion work product means that it has to be the attorney's mental impressions, conclusions, well, it, it opinions, theories. It could be if theories. opposing counsel's correct that the information that is subject to disclosure would allow you to determine what was the what lawyer's the, theory the and mental impression. Correct. If you're satisfied that it doesn't reflect it, then opinion work product wouldn't play. Correct. And our position is that it doesn't. In fact, in their petition, they concede, the hospital concedes, that these reports, not the, not the lawyer's letters, the reports, quote, contain opinions of external individuals asked by hospitals' attorneys to review records and provide opinions. They concede it's not the attorney's opinions, well, mental if impressions. Well, if you're going to accept that concession, that it's reflective of outside experts' opinions. How does that help your argument that these contain peer review information that would not otherwise have been available? Because in the, in the statute, um, in section three, when they define, when the, um, the Constitution defines adverse medical incidents, and Judge Silverman, you started to go there. It actually has a disjunctive or at the very tail end of that section. Are you in subsection three? Yes, Your Honor. Subsection three, defining adverse medical incident. And it states, incidents that are reported to or reviewed by any healthcare facility peer review, risk management, quality assurance, credentials, or similar committee. I'll submit to the court, there's no case law on point, but that or similar committee opens the door for just this type of external peer review. In the letter that the lawyer sent to the peer review company, and it, there's no dispute, it's a medical peer review company identified as MD Review, located in Ketchum, Idaho. Um, it makes no difference whether this review is done in-house, whether it's done but it in Idaho. Like, it doesn't sound like that is a peer review committee. It sounds like this is an outside expert. It is a peer review committee, though, because explain, that's precisely. Explain it, explain okay, it well, in the statute or in the uh, Constitution, uh, it says or similar committee. So I said it, no court has no court has identified what that term means. It's a dis disjunctive, meaning it 
can stand on its own. But it, so it's it a, talks about health care, <laughs> the phrase health care facility is Correct. in there. Right. In context, okay. this all seems to me to say, basically, internal peer review material is discoverable. It does, but the or similar committee is the part where it triggers what they're doing here. If this court reverses. So you would insert, uh, for linguistic purposes, you would insert or similar external committee. I don't even need the external. I think, a, I think an external, I think the peer review committee or the peer review entity called MD Review. I, know. I mean, I can read it and say, well, a hospital might label it, you know, uh, Q1 committee. And so that would be a similar committee to a healthcare facility peer review risk management <coughs> quality assurance. Or it could label it our loss prevention committee or you know, some other name. It seems to me at least arguable that's what this is designed to avoid is a hospital creating another named entity to avoid calling it a peer review risk management quality assurance credentials committee. I can see your point, but, but, the, but what, going back to the Constitution and the intent of the voters, which was to lift the shroud of, of secrecy, whether it's in-house, whether they outsource it to India or Idaho, it's the same concept. They're having another expert medically review what this doctor has done wrong. It's an adverse medical incident. There's no dispute about that. It's conceded in their petition that they may have adverse medical incidents. So They're not saying are that you, they are Is it your position that the traditional analysis of a lawyer hiring an outside expert in medical malpractice cases is gone? Unique. I would say unique under the circumstances of each case. I would not make a blanket statement like that, Your Honor. I would say because it is such a sacrosanct privilege. So if our review of the this, document reflects or satisfies us that this falls within the traditional outside expert, then we should reverse. Um, if that's your review, but, my, but the uh, respondent's position is clear that right, this you're, you're between this a rock is, and a hard place because you don't know what the document says. <laughs> Correct. You haven't but seen I, it. But I do. And it, it's called a peer review document. Three times in the letter that assigns the work and says, send your, send your opinion, Mr. Doctor Expert, after you reviewed Dr. Larry's report, send your opinion to me, the lawyer, and to who else? The risk manager at the hospital. This is no different than what the hospital does by statute when they do peer reviews. They are circumventing the constitutional amendment. This is a workaround. There's a Florida Bar article on it, which is just interesting. It's not uh, precedent for this court. But it talks about this very issue that once Amendment 7 was passed, this was the workaround to use lawyers to circumvent what should be the public's right and the patient's right and access to these very documents. So um, this court had it in Neely, and Judge Silverman, you were on that panel when the court decided that work product, uh, common law work product immunity, non-privilege immunity doctrine, is no different than the statutory privileges of confidentiality that existed before Amendment 7. And so in Neely, without distinguishing between whether that was an issue of opinion or fact work product, this court wrote that um, the work product materials are not exempted under Amendment 7. Similarly, and I would not make that blanket statement on the attorney-client privilege, but similarly, under the facts of this case, the intent of Amendment 7 is not to allow any type of sh uh, clouding or, or uh, uh, cloaking or secrecy, uh, shroud of secrecy on these type of peer review documents. These are not opinions of the uh, attorneys, they're opinions of the medical experts reviewing the doctor at issue in this case and his work um, on other incidents. Didn't, didn't the court in Neely in the footnote two yes. specifically carve out this case? It did. And, and no, I mean this case, meaning the one in front of us, by pointing out that, that in, in Neely, the scenario was not one where the outside attorney communicated with the healthcare professional. It, it in did. so doing, aren't, weren't they basically saying, look, that might be a different situation, which is the different situation yes. we have here. So you're, Absolutely. you're kind of asking different. us to say, well, despite what was put in Neely, it's now time to take that extra step. You have to look at the extra step. It's been raised. There's no question. And, and if the court really wanted us to do that, why bother with a footnote? Because it wasn't an issue. It would have been dicta in that it case. Was, the it's attorney still client. Dicta. It's still dicta in that case. But, but they went out but, of their way to say, well, wait a second. It, we're, we're, let's be very careful when we start infringing on attorney client because our court 
has never said that the constitutional amendment obviates the attorney-client privilege. Correct. This court, no, no court has done that <coughs> yet. No court has done that yet. But I think that based on the You're facts, you think that's I am coming. anticipating it somewhere down the line, either here or, or, or further down the road. Um, if this court wrote, wrote an opinion, you would have to address the issue. Do you think, do you think that there should just be no, no, uh, situ no scenario where, where even if the attorney is the one asking for the outside consultation, that that should still be discoverable? I think it depends on the facts of the case. I really well, do. Well, why, why in this case? Because you, why, why, would, why are you entitled to that in this case? In this case, if you look at the letter that was disclosed for this court's review, the attorney... Because it uses the term peer review. Three times. Three times. That's exactly what they're doing. And they're using an attorney just to hand the, <clears throat> hand the medical charts to the peer review. Um, and they're using an outsourced third-party peer review in an attempt to circumvent the Constitution. That's not what the voters intended. It's not what the Florida Supreme Court... Uh, intended when it recognized the herald of a new era and I, I guess shift. I'd, be, I'd be much more persuaded if there was any indication that the hospital did not conduct what it's required to conduct as far as peer review. That in fact, and I think you've agreed, yes, they have their internal peer review and we did get discovery of that. So, so, what's, so what's to stop a hospital from taking their really bad cases and sending them externally in and order to might, protect might, and cloak? At that point, you might that's, have a great argument a that problem. they, in fact, have circumvented it. That's the, but, that's the issue. That's, but that's not the issue in this case because in this case, you're acknowledging, yes, they've had their internal peer reviews, and yes, we've gotten that material. What we don't have is this document <coughs> that's called an outside peer review, which perhaps we are convinced will be an independent expert opinion in the traditional independent expert sense. Why shouldn't we get them both? If they are peer reviews pursuant to the Constitution. If they're peer reviews. If they're peer reviews. Well, they, the letter so is the, label, they, is the label determinative or is the contents and the mechanism of obtaining it determinative? I think all. I think the label is a signal. It's an it's a indicator at the outset of what that is supposed to be. It's a peer review. We can't call it anything else. And then the content probably also dictates that as well. I think it's conceded by uh, the hospital that these are the reports are opinions of the experts. They are external individuals, not the lawyers. So but if it wasn't called peer review <laughs> under the traditional analysis, it wouldn't be discoverable unless the expert was going to be used to trial. Correct. That's correct. That's true. But under under this under the Constitution, Do I we think know what we have the judge's order. And I guess I'm trying to get a sense because it, it's not clear to me. Was the judge persuaded by the fact that it's labeled peer review? Do we know? No, I think the judge was frustrated, um, quite frankly. If you read the four or five page order, um, she indicates the, the um, receipt of the documents was in some type of disarray. And she spent painstaking time going through the documents, relabeling them. But we're lucky because we only have a few categories, <laughs> a few documents. That much. So, I, so her, her order spent more time on, on the um, reassembling and correlating and, and making sure she is uh, looking at it uh, in painstaking review, but does not indicate what she was persuaded by with regard to your question, Judge Silverman, on labeling or content. That's just not in the record or in her order. Um, but I would submit to the court that you have the documents. You have the letter from the attorney. Uh, I think the title, the three times the attorney mentions it in his letter, is, is clear that it is a peer review. The amendment to the Constitution clearly says or similar committee. And hospitals, medical providers, should not be allowed. That is not what the voters wanted. They should not be allowed to circumvent the Constitution by outsourcing. You cannot circumvent and slap on privileges or immunity, work product immunity, by using an attorney. That's not what that constitutional amendment intended. So I respectfully request that this court affirm the trial court's order. Thank you. Thank you. Just an answer to your question, Judge Silverman. Actually, the trial court's order does show exactly what the trial court was looking at. And I will agree with opposing counsel that I think the trial court was very frustrated with the pile of documents she had to go through. But in every case that she determined something had to be produced, her uh, determination was based on the fact that it reflected an adverse medical incident. 
That seemed to be the sole factor that she was looking at. And admittedly, under Amendment 7, adverse medical incident are those things that, that the hospital has to be produced. But also, it has to be produced in the course of a hospital. Every business. expert report in a medical malpractice case is analyzing an adverse medical incident. Exactly. Or it, is, or it is opining as to well, did, it, did the doctor meet the standard of care or not. Correct. So it seems like at least a part of the position of the appellee is your lawyer called it peer review, he asked for peer review, he got peer review, the Constitution talks about peer review, and I, as I understand your argument as well, even if it is called peer review, it's not the facility's peer review. Exactly. The, what what um, counsel's position is that the lawyer asked for peer review. That just makes all the difference in the world. It's not the hospital's peer review. The peer review is required by statute. The hospital did do peer review. That statutory requirement does not require specific documents to be created one way or another, unlike the risk management statute requires. Um, well, there's if the hospital's in-house counsel, if the hospital's risk management person, uh, if the executive officer of the hospital sends it out to an external peer review, I think you'd have a hard time arguing that that would not be discoverable. Your, your case turns on this is outside litigation counsel. A absolutely. And he called it peer review, but it really isn't peer review because it's not, or if even if it is, it's not the facility's peer review. A absolutely, Your Honor. Um, case after case after case says we don't look at a motion or whatever by what is labeled. We look at what's in, we're looking at what really happened and what the relief is requesting. Um, we don't look at a cert petition. If it's really an appeal, we're going to deal with it on what it is and, and what to do. Um, in Acevedo, the third district said, nothing in Amendment 7 suggests voters intended to create a chilling effect with legal, within the legal profession by mandating disclosure of opinion work product. Um, in, my, in my humble opinion, it would be a sad day when this court decides that a hospital, unlike any other person in the world, has no right to consult with their counsel to receive advice when it identifies a potential problem, no matter what the counsel's investigation is called, consulting with experts or obtaining a peer review. A hospital should be able to rely on its interaction with counsel as being confidential. And for those reasons, Your Honor, we ask you to quash the trial court's order that required the production of those 15, 16, and 20 privilege log feet. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. The next case is Isaacs versus Sarasota County Property Appraisal. Um, yeah,